My name is Jake Harrison. I'm just an average office worker in my 30s, toiling away in the daily grind of commuting between home and work. Aging and getting tired seems inevitable, but one of the main causes of my fatigue is the influence of my boss, Mrs. Wilson. Mrs. Wilson is competent, beautiful, and look like a model. On top of that, she is an elite who's been promoted early due to her excellent performance. She's so perfect, people often joke that God must have mistakenly packed all the talent into one person when he created her. However, for some reason, she's tough on me. Jake, there was another error in your paperwork, wasn't there? I, I'm sorry. I'm not looking for an apology. I want to know why you made a mistake. Listen carefully to what people say, because I often make mistakes. I frequently get scolded by Mrs. Wilson like this. That kind of thing put extra pressure on me to avoid making mistakes, and as a result I'm exhausted. Hugh, it's always so relaxing here. While saying so, I take a seat on a bench in a park. The park is close to my office, but there are not many people because there are homeless people. That's why I often take breaks here. It's my hidden retreat. Well, let's see how much I can get done today. After finishing my sandwich quickly, I took out some yarn from my bag. People might say it's feminine, but I've always enjoyed crafting. That's why I'm silently knitting here as a way to relieve stress. There's another reason I choose to knit here. Back again today, Jake. Hello, Joe. When I'm knitting, an old homeless man comes to sit next to me. This man is Joe. He's a friendly guy, a good conversation partner for me. People tend to shun him because he's homeless, but Joe doesn't mock me for knitting or call me feminine. He always listens to my stories. I started talking with Joe like this a few months ago. Actually, at that time, I was dumped by my girlfriend I wanted to marry. We had been together for three years, but one day she suddenly disappeared, calling me effeminate and disgusting. She had moved out, left me, and that made me so desperate. Even though we dated for three years, the way she dumped me was unbelievable. The woolen hat I knitted for her. In the end, I couldn't give it to her. Honestly, I thought about throwing it away. That's when Joe started talking to me. Are you really going to throw that away? Yeah, but would you like to use it? I plan to give it to my girlfriend, but I don't need it anymore. I must have had a devastated look on my face at that time. Joe listened to me compassionately. This encounter became the starting point, and Joe and I began to chat frequently in this park. He still treasures the hat I gave him at that time. He's a truly kind person. You seem even more passionate today. Yeah, you know what? I made a mistake again today. During the brief lunch break, talking to this old homeless man is my way of relaxing. Joe listens to my stories with interest, and I enjoy our time. But the fun time always ends quickly. Well, I'll be back. Don't make a mistake next time. As I packed up my knitting and handed Joe some snacks I had bought for him, I left the place. A few weeks later, I was assigned to go on an outside job with Mrs. Wilson. Mrs. Wilson is very efficient at her work and very popular with our clients. Honestly, I wonder if I'm really needed, but it seems like the reason is the luggage is heavy, so help me. I can't help it because my sales skills are lacking, but I was knitting in the park today, hoping that she would rely on me a bit more. Hello, Jake. Joe, hello. Sorry, I might not be able to stay long today. I have an outside job after lunch. That must be tough. As usual, he said to me in a relaxed tone. When I talk to him, I feel tension leave my shoulders, and I can relax. He may have once had a job where he had to talk to people. As I was thinking that, my phone rang suddenly. It was Mrs. Wilson. Jake, where are you right now? I'm at Cozy Park. That's perfect. Just decided to use my car for today's field job, so I'll pick you up. After Mrs. Wilson said that, I checked my watch. Indeed, lunch break was almost over. The timing was perfect. I was called by my boss, so I'll leave soon. Is it the scary boss you were talking? Ah, uh, don't say that in front of her. I saw Mrs. Wilson car stop at the entrance of the park. I'm sorry, Mrs. Wilson, 
for picking me up. It's on the way, so it doesn't matter. I didn't know there was a park here. Huh? Mrs. Wilson stared at me in the park and froze. To be precise, she was looking at Joe, who was behind me. D Dad? Huh? Mrs. Wilson ran up to Joe and hugged him. I've been looking for you. I was so worried. Jake, who is this beautiful person? Huh? Looking at the clueless Joe, Mrs. Wilson was frozen. I told Mrs. Wilson that he has amnesia. Knowing the fact, Mrs. Wilson seemed to be shocked. No way. Dad, did you forget about me? Are you sure you're not mistaken? I can't believe I have such a beautiful daughter. You're not mistaken. Because those gloves, they were made by mom. Saying that, Mrs. Wilson was teary-eyed. Come to think of it, Joe always wore those ragged gloves. Even though they were worn out with holes and missing fingers, it was something he had worn since he came here. He seemed to cherish them. Mrs. Wilson asked Joe several times, but Joe just tilted his head. It wasn't getting anywhere like this, so I decided to leave the park with Mrs. Wilson for now. It was time for work, after all. During the field job, we were silent all the way. Mrs. Wilson, who never put personal feelings into her work, is strict but handled things professionally until the work was over. But as soon as the field job ended and we arrived at the parking lot, she burst into tears, perhaps unable to hold it in any longer. All alone, she muttered softly, Dad, was it so traumatic that you forgot? She looked so pitiful. Mrs. Wilson, um, if you're okay with it, I'll listen to you. I said this more as a consolation, but it seemed Mrs. Wilson had wanted someone to listen, and she slowly began to talk about Joe. No, about her father, Mr. John Wilson. The Wilson family was a bit wealthier than the average family. Mr. John was a school teacher, and his wife was a nurse. However, when Mrs. Wilson was just starting her career, her mother passed away suddenly. She was involved in a traffic accident, it seemed. Dad loved mom so much. After she passed away, he quit his job and secluded himself all the time. At the time, Mrs. Wilson, who had already moved out of the house, would check on her father in between work. But as it got busy, she couldn't go home often and couldn't get through on the phone. When a worried Mrs. Wilson finally returned home after a long while, Mr. John was gone. I filed a missing persons report, but he couldn't be found. If I had been by his side, this wouldn't have happened. It seemed like Mrs. Wilson had been blaming herself for her father's disappearance until now, and she cried sorrowfully. Seeing that also hurt me, and I wanted to bring Joe home. But Joe didn't react very well to Mrs. Wilson, and even if I took him home in his current condition, he would likely return to the park. Including getting him examined at a hospital, the hurdles are quite high. Dad, if we return home, will he remember something? Even if he doesn't remember, at least I want to take him to the hospital. Mrs. Wilson, as a daughter worrying about her father. I thought, and then came up with a good idea. Hey, Mrs. Wilson, let's knit. Knit. Joe. I mean, Mr. John is a really kind person. The reason I first became friends with him is because he spoke to me when he saw me knitting. He also cherished his gloves, so if you give him a gift, he might be interested and listen to you. Joe always seemed to have an interest in knitting. Then Mrs. Wilson also said optimistically, my mom used to knit a lot. He might vaguely remember that. However, she looked down a bit. But I've never knitted before. It's okay. I'll teach you. Jake, thank you. I'm sorry you had to see me like this. Mrs. Wilson smiled weakly. She seemed a little worried, but it seemed like she wanted to do something for her father. Looking straight at me, she asked, could you teach me how to knit again? Yes, of course. And so I found myself teaching Mrs. Wilson to knit. However, there are only a few places where Mrs. Wilson and I can practice together. We can't go to her house, so we decided to knit in the car. Um, could you take that thread? Like this? Yes. Now, put it through that loop. Oh, it's not going in well. Should I push it further in? Well, no, don't pull the yarn like that. But things weren't going smoothly. I think we had this kind of conversation about five times. Mrs. Wilson is very capable at work, but turns out she's actually incredibly clumsy. When the idea of knitting came up, it made sense that she might look down 
I honestly thought it would be a long haul, but that's our relief boss, Mrs. Wilson. Apparently, she practiced at home, and before we knew it, she was getting the hang of it. She was using the most basic stitch, and it was pretty rough, but... Still, she kept at it for several months. Somehow, Mrs. Wilson finished knitting a scarf. Finally done. Let's go deliver it. But, what if he doesn't accept it? He's not that kind of person. Come on. I wanted to show Joe the scarf that Mrs. Wilson worked so hard to make, so I took her hand and headed to the park. I used to come to the park quite often, but this was Mrs. Wilson's first time since that day. When Joe saw us, he said in his usual calm voice, Oh, isn't it Jake? You're not alone today. Go ahead, Mrs. Wilson. I know. With a bit of nervousness, Mrs. Wilson looked straight at Joe and offered him the scarf. Dad, it honestly makes me so sad that you've forgotten me. But I was so relieved to know you're alive. I won't even ask you to come back to home, but I don't want you to catch a cold. I made this in the same color as the scarf my mom used to wear often. It's not as good as hers, but I'd like you to accept it. While telling her heartfelt feelings as a daughter, Mrs. Wilson gives the scarf towards him with a smile. Mrs. Wilson mother was good at knitting, and this time, Mrs. Wilson had made a scarf with a design similar to the one her mother often wore while she was alive. It was filled with Mrs. Wilson hoped that it might jog his memory a bit. Joe accepted the scarf and said, it's warm. I wonder why, I feel so warm here, just looking at your smile. Ha ha, I wonder why, I'm in tears. Joe said that as he wrapped the scarf around his neck, touching his chest and shedding a single tear. I wasn't expecting his memory to miraculously return just because of a scarf, but it seemed to have have kind of triggered it. After that, he started going to the hospital with Mrs. Wilson, my boss. We're not sure if his memory will ever fully return, but it's said to promote Joe's health and social recovery. He didn't want to be hospitalized, but recently Joe has stopped going to the park and has started to return to Wilson's family home. Perhaps it's because of these positive progress that Joe has started to occasionally remember his own name, which made both Wilson and me happy. By the way, he still has the scarf I gave him, and he wears it alternately every day. Thank you, Jake. It's all thanks to you. And so, I returned to my usual routine of knitting in the park. On that day, Wilson came and sat next to me. Wilson stands out in a good way at the office, so I appreciate being able to talk with her in the park. I'm grateful, but ever since that knitting, Wilson has been acting much more casual with me. I guess we've gotten close, but to me, Wilson is too attractive, and it makes my heart race. What am I doing at my age? I feel so pathetic. You're the one who put all the effort into knitting, Mrs. Wilson. I didn't really do much. Teaching me to knit wasn't a big deal to you? Um, well, haha. I gave her eye smile as I stuffed my mouth with a sandwich. Through our interactions, I've come to understand that Wilson tends to be stern with those she has high expectations of at work. She had high expectations of me too, which is why she apologized for being so strict. So, Jake, would you like to have dinner with me sometime, to thank you also? At really? I was taken aback by her unexpected suggestion, but Wilson laughed and said, of course, or you don't want to have dinner with me. I'll go. I would be honored. I jumped at the chance, which made Wilson laugh again. You're honest. Can we exchange our contact? Yes, I just realized I don't know your contact, Mrs. Wilson. Call me Sophia. Register me as that, Jake Harrison. What? I froze at hearing my full name, but Wilson just input my contact and then casually said, I'll contact you later and left. Wilson, she knew my full name all along. It makes me happy and can't help but grin. I'll try my best to get her trust enough for her to call me by my name. While making such determination, I start knitting. A scarf woven in shades of blue and white is what I'm planning to make. I hope to finish it before the dinner with Sophia. And then, I will tell her what I feel. I love you. Will you be my girlfriend? I knew it. You took forever to say it. When I finally gathered the courage to confess my feelings over dinner, she happily said so. I wondered if I had been such an open book. But if she got the message, that's all that matters.
So we officially became a couple, progressing steadily in our relationship, and eventually we decided to get married. By the way, we haven't had our wedding ceremony yet. Actually, when I proposed to her after a year of dating, I asked Sophia when the marriage registration was supposed to be done. I was thinking we should do it on a special date, but Sophia seemed to have different plans. You do realize I'm over 30, right? Yeah, I know. Don't keep a woman waiting forever. I want to get married right away. Otherwise, I'm afraid someone else might snatch you away from me. What a cute thing to say, so we submitted the marriage registration before the ceremony. So now, although Sophia and I are married, I'm still doing my knitting at the same park. I want to wear a stole you made at our wedding. When you hear something like that, it motivates you, doesn't it? Plus, Joe is planning to come to the wedding. He hasn't remembered everything yet, but he's slowly recalling bits and pieces of his past. I thought our wedding might serve as some kind of trigger, but he seemed unsure, asking am I even supposed to be there, with an anxious look on his face. So to ease Joe worries, I'm planning to gift him something I've knitted too. According to him, the things we've knitted have been like good luck charms to him and have been really reassuring. What color should I go for? Imagining my future bride, I pick up my yarn again today. I first met her while I was hiking to observe alpine plants, halfway along the descent route towards the cabin where I was planning to stay overnight. She was crouched at the side of the trail, looking unwell. She appeared to be in her late thirties, and she was radiant yet somber, a young widow. Again this week, seriously, my name is James, but around here, they call me Michael Thompson. I work as a researcher of alpine plants at the county museum. For four weeks in a row, when I told my wife, Michelle, that I was going alone to the mountains to observe alpine plants over the weekend, she'd reacted hysterically. It's part of my job, Michelle, there's nothing I can do about it. Back in college, I was part of the athletic club and was invited to go hiking by a senior member. The first mountain I climbed was about 6,500 feet high. I was captivated by a small wildflower known as the queen of alpine plants that I saw at the summit of that mountain. I was fascinated by the small wildflower that had white and pink petals blooming on the rocky ground. Since then, mountain climbing became my hobby, and this passion led me to my job as a researcher of alpine plants. What do you say to Jacob? Jacob is our six-year-old son. Michelle said that I will take him to the amusement park this weekend, as I've been postponing our promise to him. Why don't you just take him, Michelle? You're the one who told Jacob about the amusement park without asking me. Leaving those words behind, I left the house with my backpack. I planned to stay overnight at the mountain cabin, and I had already submitted my climbing plan. I would get to the trailhead by transferring between trains and buses. Is this what they call going through a rough patch? On my way, I recalled the argument with Michelle. It left a sour taste in my mouth. I arrived at the trailhead just after 9 a.m. While climbing towards the summit, I observed alpine plants. It was just after 3 p.m. On my way to the mountain lodge where I'd reserved a one-night stay, I ran into a woman who was sick. I escorted her back to the lodge and nursed her back to health overnight. After regaining her strength, we parted ways at the trailhead the next day. On a whim, I stopped by a local shop at the foot of the mountain and bought a souvenir, candies, for my wife and son for the first time. What's this? When I handed over the mountain treats, my wife, Michelle, looked at me in confusion. I called out to Jacob, who was in his room, telling him I'd brought back a souvenir. Having had his promise of a trip to the amusement park broken, Jacob, sulking, deliberately stomped his feet as he came over. Hoisting Jacob onto Miney, 
I told him, I swear I'll take you to the amusement park next weekend, for real this time. Really, really? Jacob asked, looking up at me. I'm not lying. Then, I opened the box of souvenir candies. Just as Jacob reached out his hand, Michelle interjected. No, you can't. Dinner is almost ready. After dinner, Jacob and I spent a short hour playing video games, took a bath together, and I put him to bed. When I returned to the living room, Michelle was watching the news on TV, seemingly bored. How about it, want a beer? I took a can of beer out of the fridge and offered it to my wife. What's gotten into you? Playing the doting dad all of a sudden, and now trying to be the loving husband. I grabbed two glasses and sat down across from my wife. Pouring the beer, I raised my glass for a toast. There's something I want to tell you. Something I need you to hear. Michelle took a sip of her beer and looked at me. I told her about the woman I met on the way to the mountain lodge, who was in po health. I thought to myself, she's taking the mountain too lightly, dressed in casual clothes like that, but I couldn't just leave her there. So, I talked to the woman. Whether she was on a tour or lost from her group, she only replied that she came alone. I didn't tell Michelle this. But I was reminded of the look on that woman's face when she looked up at me after answering my questions. With her glossy hair tied back and a certain melancholy in her eyes, I was captivated by her. And then I had a thought. Alpine plants possess a unique beauty. The higher the altitude they inhabit, the more I perceive their beauty to intensify. I've wondered why this is especially considering the harsh natural conditions of these high-altitude areas. After all, plants such as flowers perpetuate life by enabling the pollen from male flowers to fertilize the female flowers. This process necessitates the assistance of wind and insects. Wind is a force we can only leave to nature, but insects we can attract. Hence, flowers bloom. The fragrance and beauty of the bloom flowers serve to attract insects, enlisting them in the process of pollination. I sensed something similar in her, the woman I encountered on my descent route, an allure that draws men towards her unconditionally. She said climbing in such light attire and getting sick, it's a nuisance, really, causing such a commotion. It's totally true. I considered taking her to the mountain cab and where I was supposed to stay. However, it was nearly an hour's walk from where I found her to the cabin, even just for me alone. So, what did you do? My wife asked with keen interest. Well, I recalled that there was a refuge cabin much closer, I replied. A refuge cabin is a mountain hut available for free to anyone encountering an emergency, such as bad weather. Most refuge cabins are unmanned, with no resident caretakers. And because they're free, some climbers use them as planned accommodation, even when it's not an emergency, which is allowed. I continued my story to my wife, carrying the woman I'd found on the mountain trail. I walked for about 20 minutes and arrived at the refuge cabin. Along the way, the sky had turned ominous, the wind was picking up, and large raindrops began to fall. The cabin was empty. Well, looks like we're imposing ourselves here tonight. She nodded, arms wrapped around herself. Looking at her, I saw her lips trembling, tinged with purple. Cold, isn't it? That's what happens when you climb a mountain rest like that. I offered her my mountain jacket that I was wearing. When you go mountain climbing, it's basic to layer your clothing. That way, if it's hot, you can take layers off. If it's cold, you can put them on. Even when I tried to explain the basics of mountain climbing, she was miles away. Then I contacted the mountain hut I had booked, explained the situation and said we would be staying in the emergency shelter that night. 
So what? You're telling me you two were alone together until morning. Silently, I nodded in response to my wife's question. Huh? And then, my wife, Michelle, spat out the words dismissively. I had brought food, drinks, and cooking utensils to the mountain hut we had booked because we planned to stay without meals. It was a bit scarce for two people, but I cooked dinner anyway. The menu was a classic instant curry. Still cold, I asked her, even though she didn't touch the curry I had made. As usual, she completely ignored me. Gradually, I began to feel irritated. Eat. If you eat, your body will warm up a bit. I don't want it. I thought she was finally reacting, but this was all she said. Still, her gloomy tone made me feel something was seriously wrong. I don't know what happened, but I sternly said to her, if I hadn't come by, your life might have been in danger. You shouldn't underestimate the mountains. But she just turned her sorrowful profile away from me and remained silent, not trying to speak. I thought I couldn't handle this anymore, so I figured all I could do was let her sleep. Did she not touch it after all? The curry you made. Yeah, she didn't eat it, I told my wife, as I grabbed another can of beer from the fridge. As night fell, the rain and wind became stronger. The sound of rain hitting the windows was loud, and drafts blew in from various parts of the hut. Why looking out the window, I asked. How do you feel? Has it improved a little? I thought she wouldn't respond, but then I heard her voice, as thin as a mosquito's. If I lie down like this, by morning, I might. Surprised, I turned to look at her. She was wrapped in the mountain jacket I had lent her covering herself from head to toe. Once again, I turned my gaze back to the window. Then I muttered, It feels like I'm stranded in the middle of a storm. Suddenly, I heard the sound of the mountain jacket rustling. I looked at her. She was sitting half upright, staring straight ahead, frozen in place. Oh, a storm, really, not at all on the side. My wife chimed in. Guess so, they're just the mountains. I answered, and my wife urged me to continue the story with a so. Afterwards, I got into my sleeping bag, but I was having a hard time falling asleep. Then, she who was asleep screamed and jumped up, looking utterly lost. Thinking she might have had a nightmare, I crawled out of my sleeping bag and shook her shoulder. Her body was ice cold. This jacket alone isn't enough. Hey, you're cold, right? She gave a small nod and looked at the sleeping bag I had been using. Can I get in there? I laid the sleeping bag beside her. Come on, get inside. She got into the sleeping bag as I told her, her body shaking from the cold. I thought there was nothing else I could do but warm her up. My sleeping bag was not the mummy type that people usually imagine, but the envelope type that's like a blanket folded in half lengthwise. If I left the zipper open, it would somehow accommodate too. I got into the sleeping bag with her. I'm pretty big body-wise. I hung half my body out of the sleeping bag and moved closer to her. She also snuggled up to me. It's warm. My wife, Michelle, slammed her beer-filled glass onto the table. With that force, the beer splashed out. What? With a woman you barely know, you're telling me you spent the night with her? Yeah. My wife, Michelle, filled with jealousy, trembling with rage, glared at me. Easy there, she's practically sick. Don't jump to conclusions. Even as I said this to my wife, I remembered the words of the woman that had made my heart skip a beat. Warm, come closer. She began to speak softly as she nestled up to me in the sleeping bag. She had lost her husband in a mountain accident that had occurred on this mountain about half a year ago. She didn't know what to do next and, in despair and pessimism about her future, 
she decided to enter the mountain to follow her husband's footsteps and take her own life. But I couldn't do it. I don't have the courage to live on, but I also didn't have the courage to end it here. As she buried her face in my shoulder, I told her, Your late husband is probably saying it's too early for you to join him. That's what I believe. Am I see? Michelle grabbed a tissue and started cleaning up the spilled beer on the table. I recalled the woman who had cried incessantly in my arms. The sensation of her body as she gradually regained her body heat. But are you sure that's all there was to it? Michelle asked, peering into my face. I said don't overthink it. Seeing my unsettled reaction, Michelle flashed a mischievous smile. She then headed to the fridge to get another beer and said, You know what they say about men. When they have something to feel guilty about, they suddenly become nice. She said that my uncharacteristic actions, like buying souvenirs from the mountain I never bought before or becoming a suddenly understanding father, were evidence of my guilt. As she said this, Michelle poured beer into my glass. She then smiled sweetly at me. It seemed that Emily's mood had improved. You know, I spent the night thinking about this with her. What would happen to you and our son if I had an accident on the mountain? Stop it. Don't even joke about such a thing. But it wasn't a joke or a lie. I had spent the night with her, seriously considering what would happen to my wife, Michelle, and our son, Tyler, if something happened to me. What if I go first? Would my wife and son even shed a tear for a man like me, a husband like this, a father like this? I pondered. That's why I decided to change my ways. I wonder how long that'll last, was my wife's skeptical response. The next weekend, I finally fulfilled my promise to my son to take him to the amusement park. I also cut down on my hiking trips. Then, several months later, one evening after dinner, as I was playing games with my son in the living room, my wife, having finished the dishes, suggested, Hey, next time you go hiking, can Sean and I come with you? Hup, I mean, yeah, sure. Beside me, Sean started making a fuss about how he wanted to go. Why didn't I think of that before? I was at a loss for words. All right, let's go. For this trip, I chose a beginner's trail and took my wife and son hiking. At one point on the trail, my wife stumbled over a rock and lost her balance. I caught her and she buried her face in my chest, exclaiming, this is quite tough. While I held her like that, Shanti's daw, you two are so lovey-dovey. We quickly let go of each other. We're almost at a rest cabin. Let's take a break there. The cabin was manned with a toilet and a shop. There were a few other hikers resting there. As I walked towards an open seat with my wife and son, I stopped dead in my tracks when I noticed a woman among the other hikers. My wife asked what was wrong. It's her, the woman I told you about. Wait, is she? The one you shared a sleeping bag with. I found myself nodding before I tapped my wife's forehead with my index finger. She chuckled and followed my gaze to the woman. She, too, noticed us. She quickly stood up and bowed her head towards me. And then she noticed us, too. She quickly stood up and bowed her head toward me. Then, she spoke to the man sitting next to her. After which, that man stood up, looked at me, and walked over. I'm her brother-in-law. Her husband, my younger brother, died. I wanted to thank you for the help you gave my sister-in-law at that time. I was urged by him to step outside. Meanwhile, she approached my wife, and they sat down together. According to her brother-in-law, they had just marked the first anniversary of her husband's death. They took that opportunity to visit this mountain, the site of the accident, to pay their respects. Since my brother passed away, she had been withdrawn 
My wife and I were concerned, but he never anticipated she would be so desperate as to think of following her late husband. If it weren't for your help, I might have lost her, too. With that, he deeply bowed his head to me. After descending the mountain and getting on the return train, Sean, exhausted from the climb, fell fast asleep. What did you talk about with her? I asked my wife as I stroked Sean's head. Just a normal chat between two women. So what did you talk about? My wife sang a little tune, teasing me. I wondered if she had questioned her about that night at the shelter. Of course, I had nothing to feel guilty about. But I was curious. Hey, tell me. Do you really want to know? My wife grinned at me. Then she spoke. She said you blushed, even at your age, when she asked you to come closer. I remembered that moment, and with no words to return, I just averted my gaze. She apologized for making such a shameless request. She said you were as nervous as a high schooler. My wife laughed out loud at that. I ended up laughing along with her. Our laughter woke up Sean, our son. Sorry for waking you, buddy. You can go back to sleep. You're not cold, are you? I said to him, and my thoughts drifted to her. Just like an alpine flower, you are beautiful. Surely you'll have wonderful encounters ahead. I wish you all the best, just like us, right now. I hope you enjoyed this. Your subscription to our channel really motivates us to create more content. See you in the next video.